Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for the introduction. And I am delighted to, to be here, uh, even though it is five o'clock in the morning, uh, to uh, share with you our results on uh, determining sequences in reticular structures. But first, I want to thank uh, the organizing committee and the advisory committee for their efforts in putting together this um, conference uh, under these uh, circumstances. And also, I want to thank the um, Deshima conference uh, team as well for all their efforts in switching over to this uh, virtual uh, conference. Um, I would have much liked to be there in Dresden to see all of you and uh, enjoy the time together. Um, but unfortunately, we will just have to do it this way under uh, these extraordinary circumstances and hope to see you in 2021 in Krakow or in 2022 um, in Dresden. So um, yeah, today I want to share with you um, my ideas and um, our efforts, and you will see some of them jointly with other colleagues in the MOF field on how we can write, read, and edit sequences in reticular structures. So uh, reticular chemistry, just in case uh, some of you are not um, in this, uh, are in this conference for the first time, um, let me just uh, give a, a definition. The, it is, we define it as the chemistry of linking molecular building units by strong bonds to make crystalline extended structures. And this definition has three very important components that happen to be the pillars of reticular chemistry. The first is that it's a, we're using molecular building blocks. So these are geometrically defined units that are linked together by strong bonds um, to make robust materials. So uh, building blocks gives you an idea about how to design the strong bonds, give you robust materials so that they can be, uh, let's say in a device capturing carbon dioxide or harvesting water from air month after month, year after year, uh, without having to change the materials so that they are cyclable and stable under the conditions uh, of operation. And of course, crystalline, that's the dream of every chemist because um, uh, characterizing your material by, by crystallography is one of the most um, definitive ways of figuring out the atomic arrangements of these uh, structures. And, and that's not trivial since by knowing those connectivities, we can learn uh, about what we're making and also we can learn how to design. So the result of reticular chemistry has been metal organic frameworks, which are uh, multi-metallic SBUs that are linked by organics to make structures of this kind. This is, of course, is the structure of Mach 5 and the yellow ball is the space within which other molecules can fill in the pores. Back in 1995, when I was assistant professor at Arizona State University, we demonstrated for the first time that linking metal ions to charged linkers to make very strong bonds, uh, we were able to crystallize those for the first time in 1995. Those were basically, I would say, the beginning of moth chemistry because we moved to these metal charged linker interactions, which are much stronger than the metal neutral linker interactions. And then it didn't take us long, but by 1998, we used the SBU approach to make MOF2 and to show uh, for the first time that these materials have permanent porosity by measuring the gas absorption isotherms. And in 1999, we showed how one can even obtain ultra high porosity in MOFs, much higher than anything that preceded uh, MOFs. So this was, I would say, the start of the field. And then from there on, we wanted to continue this idea of reticular chemistry by showing that uh, you don't need metals to link organics together, but now you can link them by organics through covalent bonds. 
and the, two, the first two decops we reported in 2005, and the first three decops uh, we reported in 2007. And now we uh, recently introduced uh, molecular weaving. Um, let me just manage this uh, pointer. I've got all these screens in front of me. Um, okay, now I'm okay. Yeah. So this is molecular weaving and it's basically the covalently linked threads. These are organic threads. This is based on cough chemistry, but these threads are then uh, interlaced or mechanically linked to give materials that have excellent mechanical properties and this is our strategy for combining dynamics with reticular structures, where these threads can move around without having to stretch or break covalent, covalent bond. We think that that is a very good way to carry out uh, dynamics. We reported these in 2016. So this reticular chemistry thinking has been quite fruitful in generating um, new materials that have no, nothing like anything that has preceded it. Um, the chemistry, as many of you in the field recognize, uh, is infinite because we've got many building units uh, in the inorganic side that could be combined with many organic units uh, as linkers. And of course the organic units can be functional and so does actually the uh, inorganic units um, to make literally millions of frameworks. And already we have identified hundreds of applications. So the chemistry is truly infinite. So many times revolutions are not recognized until they pass. And I think we are in the middle of a revolution here in materials. I believe that these are the 21st century materials that will assist us in solving some of the environmental problems, energy problems, water problems that are uh, facing the world. Clearly this chemistry has gained wide acceptance around the world and just for MOF, COF, ZIF, you can see that 102 countries by this year have institutes and research uh, groups uh, in, this, in this field with over 20,000 publications uh, thus far. So with, with so many new people coming into the field, and needless to say, that these people are from many different backgrounds, um, we, the field, people in the field, including my group, uh, in this case, in collaboration with one of my postdocs and Stefano Conasso and uh, uh, Stefan Butke, um, Felipe Gandara, Chao Eli, Laura Gagliardi and myself have come together to put together an, or an attempt to put together a standard practices of reticular chemistry. So we tried our best to capture scientifically what we are doing in the lab. Of course, there with some deviations, uh, we don't want just a protocol that everybody follows, but it looks like this is approximately what everybody does or roughly what everybody does. But we also identified some quality indicators shown in, in the squares. And we needed these standards so that to communicate uh, to those new in the field and the emerging scholars in the field, um, some of the things that they need to pay attention to while conducting uh, their research. Um, so I believe that this article is quite helpful for starting students. So I, I would not hesitate in giving it to new students as they come in into our, our laboratory. Another thing that uh, I think has been important in, uh, uh, as the field has matured is this idea of uh, looking at structures in terms of their underlying topology. This is a, a very nice way to systematize what is out there and I want to acknowledge the contributions over the years by Professor Davide Puserpio for Topos Pro and Michael O'Keefe, my colleague and long-term collaborator um, for, uh, for um, 
figuring out how to reduce structures uh, to determine their underlying topology. In general, really, it's a way to help us look at the grammar and also develop the taxonomy of reticular structures. And this, uh, therefore, it's possible for us to take geometric building blocks and link them together and then think about what structures might be possible. I think their efforts have helped us tremendously in this, in this regard. You can see here, this is applicable both in terms of linking organic and inorganic or organic and organic. And you can see here, based on the geometry that you're linking together, you can get different structures. And in general, these are the most symmetric possibilities among many, many possibilities. And these are the ones that we all have been uh, making or the majority of the ones that we have been making. Fortunately, there's still more um, that the emerging scholars can plug into and try to develop. There's still a lot of chemistry to be developed. Pick any square here and you find that in fact, you could spend an entire career developing the chemistry of a structure in this square because the variety of building units that could be used in terms of composition, size, and in terms of the chemistry of the pores. And we can go, um, uh, many of us have demonstrated that the building units can be much more than these simple ones up here, and they can be more complex. And you can see as we go to more and more complex, more and more effort is needed to fill some of these squares. But this, what I call the, between quotes, periodic, reticular table um, is a very nice guide uh, showing um, what kind of structures might result from putting together uh, molecules with specific geometries. So the, the, in this um, approach, um, if you can think it, there is a way to make it. And I would say there is a, a, the chemistry is straightforward. It's not a multi-step synthesis. It's a one-step synthesis to make what I hope to show you at the end, if I have time, magnificent materials, in, and as I would show you for water harvesting. So what are, so if we step back uh, and ask, what are some of the important characteristics of reticular structures, what reticular structures have done uh, for us? Um, and by, by putting different building units together, uh, different unit geometries, um, we have um, obtained a diversity of, of structures. So we have diversity in this chemistry, but we also have multiplicity. We obtain multiplicity by deploying different types of linkage. So for example, for MOFs, a charge linker linked by transition metal ion is responsible for making MOFs. Uh, covalent bonds, such as CN bond, CC bond, imine bonds, um, ethylene type of bonds uh, to make coughs, mechanical bonds to make weaving. So we have diversity and we have multiplicity. But what happens when we start introducing, and this is the special thing about MOF chemistry, if you know the conditions under which an SBU form and you maintain your linkage, in this case carboxylate, one can put different uh, functionalities on the organic unit, as you see here for these different functionalities, and incorporate all of those into the moth, okay? So, so that you have uh, a situation where um, the, the moth contains not just your linker, but also has protruding onto, into its pores a variety of organic functionalities. Okay, you can do this for the organic functionalities, but also you can do this for um, the metal units. So in this case, this is MOF 74, which we reported in 2005. But in 2014, we showed that in fact, you can take these rod SBUs and fill them up with different metals. So in this MOF, we have introduced 10 different metals to create a variety 
across the SBUs of, of, these, of these metals. So what I'm trying to say is that this multivariation arrangement within the structures emerges as you start introducing different type of either organic functionalities or metal units in the, in, the, in the SBUs. So from this point on, I'd like you to consider yourself a molecule and imagine yourself floating through the pores and looking around the pores. I think this is the best way to appreciate the next segment of my talk. If you do that in this structure, you can easily see as a molecule floating in the pore, you can easily see truly a multi-variable environment where uh, there is no uh, uh, repetition or no periodic repeat in terms of the organic units. But in terms of the backbone, there is a perfect repeat from one unit to the next, from one uh, point to the, to the next. And the same would be true if you are in the pores here, looking around and looking at the metals the various metals that decorate or that are part, an integral part of the SBU. In both of these cases, you have not, if you take an X-ray powder diffraction of, of a material like this or like this, you will see diffraction lines because the material is ordered, the backbone is ordered. What is not ordered, of course, is the, uh, is the positions of the metals and the, here, the functionalities. Now this is different, and I want to emphasize this, this is different than multi-component MOFs. Multi-component MOFs means that you have different building units that come together to make a crystalline material, the backbone. In this case, if I am a molecule floating through the pores, I will see uh, these units repeating throughout the crystal. There is no variation here. This is a, just a repetition of a unit cell over Avogadro's number worth of unit cells in a, let's say, a crystal that I would see under an optical microscope. So these are not multivariate and they should not really be confused with uh, what I refer to as multivariate. Uh, you, one can add as many different building units, components as you can, but at the end, if they are ordered within that backbone, they're not multivariate. So on the other hand, they can, these can be made multivariate if I introduce functionalities, different kind of functionalities on one or more than one of these linkers, and then these functionalities are in fact uh, disordered. So, so what does multivariation mean? And how, how do we describe it? How do we classify it? How do we characterize it? And then ultimately, of course, how do we use it? These are the questions that I will attempt to answer today but I can't answer them really without the help that I have had over the last uh, three, four months with um, this incredible collaboration with uh, Dr. Stefano Canosa and Professor Stefan Budke. Uh, they have been absolutely instrumental in shaping the material that I will be discussing in terms of the nature of multivariation and then sequences in uh, reticular structures. So, what does multivariation mean? Uh, this uh, illustration here shows, I think, very well how one can uh, tell if they have a multivariable system. Here is, here is my MTV MOF. And the best way to describe the multivariation is to separate the backbone from the disorder or from the functionalities that are note covalently attached to that backbone. Okay, so it's an integral part of the backbone, but I can separate, at least conceptually, the functionalities from the backbone. And, and immediately you see how disordered the functional groups are. Now chemists, I would just wanna say something here. Chemists, including myself over the years, we have been fixated on the idea of making symmetric structures, crystalline structures, order structures that repeat in the crystal. And that's good. It has a many important applications, not the least of which that you could uh, characterize the material very well, but also many applications, as you'll see, 
with water harvesting, if you don't have a crystalline material, you just can't get the, uh, the property that you need in terms of harvesting water from uh, desert air. So um, we need to shift our thinking. We need to change the way we think. And moths help us do that because, because this disorder is not everything that I have. I also have an ordered backbone. So I could use this order to understand this disorder. And so we have to begin, and I think MOF chemists are at the leading edge of this. We need to start thinking in terms of this hetero, what I call heterogeneity that is superimposed onto order. Um, this is not new. Biology has used this. Let's say in DNA, you have a repetitious backbone and a polyphosphate sugar backbone that one can distinguish from the disordered or the arrangement of the nucleotide in a sequence. Um, and these nucleotides, just like the functionalities in MOFs, in concepts are very similar. They are covalently linked to that, to that backbone. So I don't think uh, it's uh, uh, too much of a, a big task to, to go from symmetric structures into symmetric structures that, that uh, house or encompass also massive disorder and make use of that, of that disorder. Not only can we think of this in terms of the organic functionalities, but also the backbone itself in some cases can have the multivariation, as I mentioned, from MOF, from MOF 74. So the very first thing we need to start thinking about is, is, is that a reticular structure, if you want to think about MTV, multivariation, uh, a reticular structure would be broken into two components. One is the backbone. This is the ordered, repeating, and monotonous backbone onto which you're attaching functionality. This is disordered, repeat, unrepeating, and quite chaotic. And, and chemists are very uncomfortable in dealing with that. So I'm trying to basically say that we all need to be comfortable in dealing with this. And for the reasons that it's attached, this multivariation is attached to an ordered backbone. And the second thing that I need to say here in this, in this uh, flow diagram is that the backbone could be multivariable as well. For example, if there is an SPU that has many different, um, different metals, they could, it could be multivariate. Uh, but you have to be very careful in terms of multivarying the fundamental components of the backbone, the organic linkers and the SBUs all at the same time, because then you'll end up with a truly amorphous or non-crystalline material. Now together, this multivariation, I believe is really the information that we need to extract from our material in the form of what I call sequences, how these things are arranged along a certain path in the, in the material. <clears throat> so, what do we know about multivariation in MTV reticular structures thus far? One is that we know the structure of the backbone. That's, we are very, very fortunate for that. Okay, and that allows me to know a lot of things. Uh, it's, you can think of it as a grid onto which you are superimposing this heterogeneity. Second thing I know is the ratio of the multivariance. So if the, mul if the variant is a metal, I know the ratio of metals in my system. I know the ratio of functionalities in my system if the variant is a functionality. So that's, that's not bad. And of course, I know their character because we can analyze for metals, we can analyze using NMR for functionalities. And so I know, I know what they are and I know their ratios. Uh, we also know where they're located in the structure. The metals are in the SPUs and we know their position. And the organic, such as in this case, they're all attached to this position, this ortho, let's call it position of the organic unit. So I know where they are. And we also know how far they are from each other. Thankfully, because of the backbone, the backbone is well-defined and it's metrically defined. And so I know exactly how far they are from each other. We don't know their spatial arrangement. We don't know what is sitting 
next to what? The green, next to another green, which is sitting next to another green, on, on this side next to a red, or all red and then the blue comes in. It's not, it's not clear what their sequence is in the structure. But all of these things are part of the puzzle that will allow us ultimately to get a, a handle onto what this sequence might be. So we can write the sequence. When we make these, whether we make them de novo or whether we make them post-synthetically, we let's call that writing. We can write the sequence. That's that's what we've been doing for the last 25 years, okay? Well, for MTV, the last, the last 10 years, I guess. But how, how do we read the sequence? How do we read them? That's, that's the big challenge. And before I go any further, I should say that whenever you edit a structure, for example, let's take MOF 520. It's an ordered structure, it's a nice chiral structure. Uh, and I introduce a substrate like this jasmonic acid to get a crystal structure of jasmonic acid, I kick out a formate and instead bind the jasmonic acid. Now, when I do that, this is not a 100% complete reaction, meaning I only load about 30% of this uh, structure or of this substrate onto the material. So, so it's not complete. So this is an MTV system. The same thing here, I'm taking a linker here and reinforcing the structure of MOF 520. Unless every single position here is occupied by this linker and retrofitted, as we called it, 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 then I have produced an MTV system. So whenever you edit a structure, you will inevitably have an MTV system. Even if you go from a crystal to crystal to crystal, this is a beautiful way to edit a structure shown by Chao Wei Li um, by kicking out a linker and a metal from the original crystal. You can make the voided crystal and then adding a different linker and a different metal. But this you can see, unless Chao Wei can tell me that this is 100.00000% complete. Um, this is then an MTV crystal. This is always you have vacancies or you have incomplete substitution and that uh, inevitably leads to a multivariation. So there are two important characteristics of multivariation in MTV reticular structures. And we can glean those from two examples. One is a post-synthetic example where we took an EarMoth 74 structure and introduced by multi-step synthesis, in, um, introduce a peptide by multi-step synthesis. This is a peptide of um, penta peptide. So seven reactions were done post-synthetically. And of course, every time I run a reaction, unless it's absolutely complete conversion, I have a multi-variate uh, system because the things that got converted are there, but also the things that didn't convert are there. Things that are partially converted are there. And then once I run another reaction that's not complete, I have another set of multivariations, so on and so forth. By the time I end up with my pentapeptide in whatever yield it might be, in this case, around 60% yield, I have a system that is laden with multivariations. So if I'm the molecule floating through the pores, I am seeing uh, more multivariation than, than I've ever seen before. Um, but this multivariation seems to do something uh, very unusual. So for example, this MOF at the end of the day is capable of doing exactly what the enzyme, in this case TEV protease enzyme that is programmed or whose job is to cleave this amide bond in this, in this um, molecule. Um, the, uh, the moth is just the second material to be able to do that, just like the enzyme. So how does it do it? Why does it do it? And again, if I am floating through the enzyme or through, excuse me, through the moth, uh, I am seeing 
many, many millions of and millions of environments because of my multivariation of the functionalities that are protruding in the pore. The backbone is not changed, but the functionalities that are protruding through the pores are um, along the, my path are different. And if I'm a substrate to be, or if I'm a catalyst that is, that is going to act on a substrate, one of these environments or a subset of these environments would be capable of doing that. So really what I'm doing is what might be referred to as combinatorial optimization. So I'm letting nature through multivariation optimally uh, make that cavity just right to carry out that particular uh, reaction, the cleaving of that uh, amide bond in the peptide. So one of the characteristics is, I would say of a multivariable system, because you have an array, a wide array of environments, is this combinatorial optimization. Another one is that if I have um, a moth like this one, um, MIL-101, and I have two different functionalities decorating the pores, and I can dial in the percent of one versus another, or the, the ratios, let's say. From that, let's say in the pores of this moth, I have different molecules, different cargo molecules. I can control the kinetics at which molecule A can leave the pore versus molecule B. And I can also control the order when A could leave and when B could leave based on these, on these ratios. So what, I'm do, what am I doing here? I am taking a moth from having one kind of pore characterized by, let's say, the environment in the pore by one discrete energy state, and I'm turning it into a system of a continuum of energy states that a substrate can sample, or that um, a cargo uh, can be controlled in terms of its release and in terms of the kinetics of, of its release. So the two important characteristics that we get out of this that are extremely important in, in, in practice in the applications of MTV MOF is that they are capable of combinatorial optimization to affect unusual properties that are not uh, obtained from the components or from the non-multivariate component, the simple component. And we are working with a continuum of energy uh, states so that we can affect complex operations in one material. So Stefano and Stefan um, uh, recommend uh, to you this MTV classification system, which is based on looking at just the primitive cell in a moth. This is a moth that's not multivariable and our primitive unit cell has a, an SBU with four metals and two linkers. So that would be basically in, in terms of understanding and, and classifying MTV, this is a very good way, I think, and I, I'm strongly supporting this approach, but uh, I, I also wanna say that this approach is, uh, is something that we are developing now and your input on it would be quite valuable. So we have four metals in one SBU and we have two linkers, L1 and L2. And everything else here depends on this, on this primitive unit cell and how it varies. So for example, in a structure like this, I have four variants and four points of disorder. And each variant has two states that they can be in. And so therefore I have um, uh, four. And so my, what we call unit cell information capacity, USIC, USIC is 16 for this moth, okay? And I've chosen basically my SBU here as, as the variant. Now, if I go to this structure, I have yanked out one of the SBUs and you can see now I have in green some capping ligands and, and in black a remaining linker. And so I have three variants and they have two states each. And so my USIC is eight. This is a more complex thing that I need to uh, discuss with Stefan and Stefano is that sometimes you can get 
uh, indirect uh, variations. I won't discuss that uh, right now, but, but I want to emphasize that I think that this system based on primitive unit cell allows us to keep track of the level of information and the capacity for uh, information in MTV systems. And now I can say that as these primitive unit cells propagate through the structure, each, uh, each one would be unique. And so together they form a sequence. And if I am a molecule walking along that sequence, I don't see any repeat. What I see is a multivariation uh, accounted for by this square of, that I defined as my primitive unit cell. So I think this is a very good system to keep track of things and to organize our mind around this uh, multivariation. So the sequence is the progression of the primitive unit cell across the crystal. Um, so, so I wanna show you two examples of our attempts to read, to read sequences. The first example, of course, you already know about that has come in 2013 in collaboration with uh, Professor Jeff Reimer. And this pertains to looking at MOF5 with two different functionalities as indicated here, different versions of, of the MOF with different combinations of these, of these building units. And just to make a, a long story short, I won't describe this in detail since I've described it several times before in this, in this conference, but we see at least on the nano level, we see the presence of large domains of one functionality versus another, where these domains are intermingled. We see small domains that are uh, um, uh, catenated with each other or that are um, uh, form the landscape of the crystal. We also see random, but we also see well mixed. So, so it's not, when you think about the multivariation, a normal old fashioned chemist would say, oh, this whole thing is just a big mess, it's random. No, it's not random. And this is just one experiment that shows it's not random. That in fact, there is some kind of organization because you are bound to a backbone. And once you're bound to a backbone, there are certain biases, depending on the electronic and sterics of how these functionalities fit and interact with each other, I can get one scenario versus, versus another. So this is very useful because I could have a reaction happening in the yellow here that affects the reaction that's happening in the blue region. So already I'm making progress in terms of the applications of these, of these materials. But this experiment shows that it's not, it's not random, that you can attain a more organized or let's say a, a system that is that has unique arrangements or one can call sequences now this is not characterized really on the molecular level this is the resolution of these experiments are on the nano level but that's that's good enough for now to to make us move along uh, but there there needs to be methods to develop uh, this chemistry on the or the sequencing on the molecular level to be able to read these sequences on the molecular level this, we, we think we've come closer to, to what uh, molecular level characterization with uh, looking at the multivariable metals. Here you see using atomic probe tomography, we were able to take MOF74 with many different metals in the background, in this case, um, uh, four different metals. And using APT, we are able to take a crystal of MOF74, align it, and then hit it with a laser so that you can shave off atomically thin uh, segments and then look at the metals that fly off by mass spec. So this is, this is just how the crystal look like. And you can see in blue, the rods, uh, the SBU rods aligned so that we can etch along the, the C axis. Um, as I mentioned, we use um, mass to charge ratios to, to characterize what hits the position sensitive detector. And from that, you can basically map the, with the depth of the crystal, you can map the presence of the different metals. In this case, the cobalt is blue and cadmium is pink. Okay, this is a moth that has two different metals. And you can also, based on the lateral resolution and the vertical re uh, resolution, 
you can determine the number of rods that you're analyzing. So this has up to here, we have 100 rods. Up to here, we have 200 rods and 300 rods. So these are the number of rods uh, that we are analyzing. And then look at, the com and, at their composition and then reconstruct this data so that you can tell the segments that have cobalt in them and cadmium. And so these are the kind of sequences that we get in a cobalt cadmium system that was prepared at 120 degrees. You get what we call a random arrangement. Okay. However, if you, if you prepare it at 100 at 85 degrees, you see something with short duplicates. Okay. This is of, um, of cobalt. And then you can get also long duplicates or insertions. So these are the different scenarios that we are observing based on the metals and based uh, also on the way we prepare them. Now, this is new information about complex matter. So it's quite impactful. Imagine yourself making a cobalt cadmium off 74, one at 120 degrees and one at 85 degrees and not knowing exactly how the arrangements are or making a cobalt manganese MOP 74 and not knowing the arrangement of the metals. Now we are able to sequence, read the sequences of metals along the rod backbone. But we're also able to decipher from rod to rod, and as you know, the rods are linked by um, this uh, penaline uh, units, uh, and, and we are able to, to decipher whether from rod to rod, they are the same or they act independently, meaning are they copies of each other, exact copies, or are they different? And in this case, when we prepare it 120 degrees, they're different. When we prepare it 85 degrees, they are copies. So this is very, very exciting because now I can understand as a molecule floating in the pore exactly my environment and we also think that this is part of potentially when you are sequencing, these are bits of information that are arranged in a sequence and perhaps could be used for in the information uh, technology. So the types of variants that I have been talking about pertain to composition, SBU and linker, but you could pick uh, the variant that you like, like pore shape and topography, orientation of chemical groups could be a variant. If you're interested in the electronic uh, character of the pores, uh, you, one can focus on that. Polarization effects, deformations, even vacancies. And the shape of your sequence could be 1D, could be 2D, could be 3D. And the components could be 0D of the 1D. The 2D component could be 0D and, and 1D. So, but, that you, but the sequence uh, theme that you, that you choose is, is, is what I'm showing here, 1D or 2D or 3D. So some remaining questions. In an MTV system, what does purity mean? Okay, do we talk about backbone purity or how do we incorporate the multivariation, our thinking? So there's a lot of work still to be done. How do we refer to purity? Because at the end of the day, the reticular chemists have to be able to speak to the general chemists. Uh, can we sequence by indirect method? I showed you sequences by direct methods, but could we, instead of just looking at direct methods, could we, for example, pick a property that my sequence is sensitive to and vary the ratio of uh, uh, the variance in my sequence and look at how sensitive that property is, document the behavior and the change in the in the property. So really the property of my material becomes the currency. And as this currency changes up or down, I can potentially get information about my sequence. Clearly computation here would be very, very helpful. Third, when the sequences are linked, can they interact productively or destructively towards a substrate? The, inter the sequences themselves are interesting, but also when the sequences start interacting, perhaps they can collude to carry out an important operation. Since the sequences are anisotropic, can a reticular 
structure, pore system function as in a circuitry. That's another aspect to think about since the sequences are unique. And five, can we describe the sequences and their behavior as a form of multiplicity where the behavior and matter or form and behavior are coupled? This, not just the structure is important, but also how does it cooperate with other structures? So this, this is a, a social science term, but I think you, you can, or a com, even a computer science term, uh, but multiplicity really gives you an idea about the extent of how connected your sequences are in terms of their behavior. Okay, so in the last minute or so, I, I just have one or two slides on water harvesting. But as you all know, um, uh, moths are beginning to address the red region of the world. Moths can operate where no other material and no other device can. And that is in the arid regions of the world. Um, all water harvesting devices that, you, that are out there commercially operate in the blue region. And we can, if you can make a material that operates in the red region as we have with MOF CO3 um, and other MOFs, then you can also cover the regions, the blue regions. So water from air anywhere, anytime, that question that I posed a while ago now is, is, is achievable. And we are now on our third generation water harvester. As you can see here, it's not very pretty. Uh, it doesn't have a, a skin on it to make it look nice and attractive, but it, this is the guts of it. It's, um, it operates, um, I will show you now a movie um, where you have, this is the collection chamber, this is the water harvesting chamber. This is where the water is condensing and gets collected, sorry, uh, at the bottom here. The rotation that you see is the rotation of the moth to, so that it can be filled with water and then removed. You can see here water being filling, filling the bottle. I want, I want to say that this device is supposed to, to be a, a home device and only supply you with four liters of water uh, for drinking, but that's based on 100 grams of moth. Let me repeat that you're getting four liters of water from 100 grams of moth. And that's quite powerful. The moth is quite powerful and you're getting it from low humidity air. So the vision of addressing that red region that I showed you where you can generate water from air is achievable through this uh, experiment. Uh, our progress has been really uh, amazing because of the way you can manipulate the moth and, manip and because of the kinetics of water uptake and release, we can do many, many cycles and we can go uh, quantum leaps or orders of magnitude higher and higher productivity. Now we are approaching almost 100 liters per kilogram of moth per day. You can look at this ACS central paper that, that we just uh, wrote. Um, on, on this uh, progress. And you can do the same and calculate in many different areas of the world what the productivity will be throughout the year. So really the vision of um, water from air any time of the year, anywhere in the world is beginning to be realized. So there's plenty of water in the air. If I was to give 50 liters um, to every uh, person on our planet, uh, we would have only used less than a fraction of a percent of the water that is in the atmosphere. I think the most important contribution here is that we can generate pure drinking water from air and this ultimately will um, achieve or water independence. What I, what I say water independence is that the individual no longer depends on anybody for their water aside from, of course, the moth. Okay, well, I think the fun has just begun with this uh, reticular chemistry field. I think there's a lot, as you can see with the MTV systems and, and others, there's a lot to be done. I think that this is, as Churchill says, it's not, it's not the beginning, it's not the beginning of the end. 
but it is, I would say, the end of the, of the beginning. And so there's a lot still to be done. I want to acknowledge the funding agencies and our collaborators, of course, my students, in addition to those I have acknowledged throughout my presentation. And also I wanna point out, especially to the emerging scholars, that you can get our book, textbook from the library, uh, download it for free. If, you, if your library uh, 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 subscribes to Angevente Shami. And I wanna thank all of you for, for your attention.